Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about something that's known as the most common neurological program, excuse me, ailment in the United States, second only to headaches. And based on scientific data, our guest today developed a five-step solution with a multidisciplinary holistic perspective, which has been missing from conventional back pain wisdom. And although it may not require surgery or any form of invasive therapy, we're going to learn about six major anatomical sites that often generate pain and other potential sources that people and doctors can easily overlook. His book is simply titled Ending Back Pain. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Dr. Jack Stern. Dr. Stern, thank you for being on the program today. Thank you for inviting me. You bet. Now let's talk about how you came to tackle this particular issue. As we said, this is something that's as common almost as having headaches for a lot of people, isn't it? It is. As a neurosurgeon who has spent significant amount of time in my career dealing with patients with back pain, it's obvious both to me and to other surgeons and non-surgeons who treat patients with back pain that back pain is not a single diagnosis. And therefore, there's not a single treatment. And what I realized when I went to the bookstore or went online is that most everything written about back pain is usually by someone who is a proponent of a particular treatment or a particular diagnosis. I didn't see anything that treated back pain Holistically, I'll say another word. For example, when you say to your internist, I have abdominal pain, belly pain, that too is not a diagnosis. That's a description, the same way low back pain is, because it could be that you have appendicitis or you have food poisoning or something more serious. That would be a diagnosis. Appendicitis is a diagnosis because then there is a set of steps that the physician, you and the physician, can take to treat your appendicitis. So I used the same analogy for the book, and I said ending back pain is not a diagnosis. It's a description. And as you indicated in your introduction, When one looks at back pain, there are only about a half a dozen things that cause back pain that are related to the back, same way there are only X number of things that cause belly pain. And I decided to write a book that helps the reader figure out for themselves and then advocate with their physicians once they have an idea or how to figure out which one of the, what we in medicine call the pain generators, something that generates or causes pain, uh, is causing their symptoms. I'll say one more word about this. The reason uh, I thought the book might be interesting and important is that once you have an idea what your diagnosis is or once the diagnosis has been made, what I do in the book, Ending Back Pain, is describe the possible treatment options. So it's not just one treatment option. I go through a variety of treatment options for each one of the pain generators, for each one of the diagnoses, and I do so from the least invasive treatment to the most invasive treatment, and lastly, I give you references from the medical literature. So it's not Jack Stern's, not my opinion. It's the opinion that I gleaned from reading the medical literature. Now, that's a lot of words right there, but in summary, that's what led me to write the book. 
Now you have this uh, five-step program, and uh, as we talked about earlier, it, you know it isn't anything that requires any kind of surgery or any kind of invasive therapy. But first of all, how does a person determine, I guess, the nature of the back pain itself? Would it be you know things such as the muscle itself or the soft tissue? I mean, how do you go about uh, determining that? Yeah, that's an interesting question and one that there is no uh, absolute answer for. So what um, you might notice someone uh, gets a copy of the book is that each one of the potential pain generators does have its relatively own signature. By signature, I mean that a muscle pain, mus muscular back pain is not going to give you usually, the, again, I'm going to point out that there are exceptions, is not usually going to give you pain that shoots down your leg. That's usually related to something that's irritating the nerve. And um, maybe a herniated disc, that's what everybody associates with it. And so in the book, I actually go through an exercise for the reader. Use a list of, um, a checklist. And hopefully, if you and your aunt, when you address the checklist, you're actually answering a group of questions that I posed. And by what your answers are, I give you a sense of what the back pain generator might be because it seems to fit that signature. So again, if your back pain, if you say, um, your back pain, yes, it, 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 if I call it for a sneeze, the pain goes shooting down my leg, and you check that off, more likely that you have a, something irritating the nerve, which may be a herniated disc. If you say that, oh, the pain is only there when, when I'm walking distances but gets better when I sit down, you check that off, it's probably, it's more likely than not that you have something called spinal stenosis. So it's a kind of a, it's for the reader to start thinking about what their problem may be. I'll add something else to that, and that's why I also have a chapter in the book about um, preparing, it's called preparing to work with your, with your healthcare professional. And that is nowadays, and I'm sure every one of your readers probably has experienced this, I certainly have, that doctors don't have as much time to spend with their patients as they used to. So if you've got back pain, and if you go through the exercises in the beginning of my book, and then you go to see your doctor, I think you will have a better idea. You, the patient, will have a better idea of what might be the problem, and you certainly will be more prepared discuss your symptoms in an intelligent way with the doctor. Um, and that's going to save the doctor a lot of time. It's going to save you a lot of time. And more importantly, it's going to uh, prompt, probably prompt, a more reasonable response and a more, and again, I, I emphasize, a more accurate diagnosis. So, um, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that answers the question. Uh, and I, I, again, I want to point out that even if you answer the questions in, in my checklist, it's not 100%, but at least you'll start thinking about what is bothering you. So, yeah, it's different if the pain is in the muscle versus, let's say, if the pain is in the bones or perhaps even in the discs themselves. Right, mm -hmm. exactly right. Can and you give sort of an idea of what the difference is? I mean, I know you kind of discussed it there, but, you know, a good feeling where people go, okay, I, I kind of get it now what you're talking about. So, Well, for example, if, um, and I want to point out that there are lots of exceptions, but this is the g general rules. Uh, say your pain came on because it was a snowy day, and you, who are usually a couch potato, suddenly decided against the better advice of your wife to go out and spend three hours shoveling the driveway. And suddenly you come in that evening and say, oh, my God, 
my back is killing me. The likelihood is that's, that's, mus- that's muscular. And you haven't been exercising, and uh, you haven't used those muscles since last winter when you did the same silly thing. And uh, it's such an obvious diagnosis that your wife makes the diagnosis because she's smarter than you are. She says, you know, take some Advil or whatever, some anti-inflammatory, and get into the tub with some Epsom salts, and it'll probably go away. So um, having an idea of how the pain came on, in this case, guy did something silly by shoveling the driveway, or it could be that um, you know, it's an elderly woman, and I, I, it's, I, I say woman because osteoporosis is more common in women, who falls and suddenly has horrific low back pain. Um, one of the things, hold on one second, one of the things... Sounds like someone who may be coming in to report their back pain. And as uh, we're going over some of the five steps that you can discover here on how to end back pain, uh, again, the book is called Ending Back Pain. Our guest today, Dr. Jack Stern, here on the Beyond 50 radio program. As we mentioned earlier, this is something that's almost as common as the common headache for a lot of people, and it's a matter of being able to diagnose exactly the nature of the pain, whether it's in the muscles, uh, perhaps it could be in the soft tissue, the bones as we're going over, or the, even the discs. <clears throat> and so that's some of the things that we're going over here. Uh, and I'm just wondering, Dr. Stern, are you back with us? Dr. Stern? I, I'm here. If you can okay. hear me. Yeah, we're still we still got you. I was just going over a brief little okay. synopsis there. So as you were saying, as I was saying, so this elderly woman um, falls and has horrific pain, and um, has a history of osteoporosis. So it's it's more likely than not that she has a, a vertebral f- a fracture of one of the vertebrae in her spine, and um, which is causing her pain. It's not likely that the sudden onset of the fall is coming from muscles or even a disc. So having the checklist at the beginning of the book helps you what I call, uh, and that's what the first chapter is called, unlocking your uh, your back's unique pain code. And that pain code involves how the pain starts, where where is the pain, what does it respond to, what makes it better, what makes it worse, and by uh, going through, and it's the same basic questions as your doctor would probably ask you if they had the time to actually spend 20 minutes or half an hour with you to go through each one of the details to help make a diagnosis. And I want to emphasize again that without a diagnosis, you cannot treat effectively. If I, as your physician, don't know what is, what's causing your pain, I can't really treat it. What I'm going to do is, like so many doctors, I'll just say take two pills and wait uh, a week or 10 days, and if it's still there, come back. And if it's still there in 10 days or two weeks and you come back, then I better well make sure that I know what's going on with you because it could be something that's potentially life or limb threatening. Or if you call me and you say, you know, uh, I suddenly don't feel my foot or I can't wiggle my toes or I'm having trouble controlling my bowels and bladder. Those are what we call um, the, the red, the, those are red lights for us. Those are warning signs and those are things that we say, you better get into my office right away, make sure that there's not a herniated disc, make sure it's not cancer, make sure it's not a, a, a fracture that's pressing against your spinal cord or your nerves. So. Knowing the symptoms and appreciating what causes the symptoms helps you, the patient, and me, the doctor, figure out what's going on. And once we can figure out what's going on, I have a better chance of of, um, treating you properly. I'll go on and say that much of the book, or not much, but another chapter of the book deals with what is the a diagnosis can't be made. Now, I would say that 20 to 25%, maybe even a little bit more, 
of patients that come in with back pain, we never make a definitive diagnosis. Um, I'm old enough to remember when I was intern, I, uh, I saw the first CAT scan ever. Uh, and certainly in my adult practice, MRIs became uh, common. And I, I just have to think back and, and say, gee, I wonder how many diagnoses we never made or missed because we CAT scans or MRIs weren't either invented yet or available yet. And I say that because I think a lot of folks who have pain where a diagnosis isn't made today, we will probably develop further technology to hone down our ability to make those diagnoses, to see living tissue um, physiologically in real time, see what part of your anatomy may be functioning improperly and causing your pain. And some of those technologies are being worked on as we speak, and I think that will help us further make a diagnosis. And then there are some folks for whom, and I emphasize this also in the book, there's also a strong body-mind connection, and for whom pain is really a manifestation of something psychological. And it's real important that your doctor and you at least raise the question, is my pain above my neck? This phrase I use in the book, meaning, is the pain really someplace in my head? And um, that's a whole topic unto itself, complex topic, because so much pain of every kind has an emotional overlay, whether it's depression, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that is an important aspect also, that if we can't figure out where your pain's coming from, we at least have to give some credence to the possibility that the pain has a psychological component. It even has a psychological component for people who have real pain, where we know what's causing the pain. But if you're in pain, and I bet you lots of us have experienced this, that you're in pain because uh, for some reason you also get depressed because you're in pain. So it's a very complex relationship. Um, and certainly that relationship gets more complicated as we get older and we find that we can do less. Um, so that I, and as someone who is, is older, I felt that I had to devote, devote some time to discussing that. It's too lengthy a conversation for a, a phone conference like this one, but it's certainly um, worth reading about. And uh, uh, I'll stop that. I'll stop that discussion of that uh, here. Um, but of course, if, if there's specific questions, I'll be happy to to pursue it further. Well, absolutely. <clears throat> now, when it comes to the uh, solutions, let's go ahead and talk about uh, what people can do about their back pain as they determine exactly what it is. Um, you know, and especially like you know, you were mentioning earlier with MRIs or X-rays. People may see that everything looks fine, but you're still hurting anyway. So, you know, let's go over about the different types of pain and the conditions associated with them, if you don't mind. No, no not at all. So, the, um, I guess it's important to review the, the concept of acute pain and chronic pain. Acute pain means pain that lasts for a reasonable period of time. And by reason, I mean, if you take 100 people who, and I'm going to pick a silly example, who uh, break their legs. Okay, you're skiing, you break your leg. Now, most any orthopedist who deals with broken legs, I, I, I don't, I'm a neurosurgeon, will tell you that 90 plus percent of patients who break their legs will have pain for this amount of time. That's called acute pain. But then there'll always be a number of individuals who have pain way beyond that period of time 
and we don't understand why. Why does uh, Mr. Smith still have pain when everybody else who went skiing yesterday and broke the leg in the same place, their pain ended three weeks ago? And that's called chronic pain. So when it comes to back pain, most people who read my book aren't reading it because they have acute pain. Because by the time they get to the bookstore, their pain's already better. The most people who read my book or need to read the book have chronic pain, pain that persists uh, way beyond or significantly beyond the time it usually takes for that pain to go away. And it sounds like you've had an opportunity to review the book. And in the book, I actually talk about myself having uh, chronic low back pain. Um, And I know for me, I have the most common diagnosis that there is, particularly as you get older, and that's degenerative disc disease. So we know that our discs dry up as we get older because the disc doesn't have a blood supply, so it can't regenerate itself. And those discs dry up and and, um, the bones get osteoarthritic, and that combination um, is, is a perfect setup for chronic back pain. And again, I'll use myself as an example. Most every morning I get up, and before, and I get out of bed, and I go, oh, my back hurts, and I kind of try to stretch, or I get on the floor and do my back exercises, and maybe take a, um, uh, some non-steroidal anti, you know, uh, an anti-inflammatory, um, and an hour or so later, I'm fine or relatively fine. Uh, and yet when I get to the gym and I work out for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, uh, I feel it again, and it's, it's, uh, it's this degeneration. And it's, so that falls under the category of chronic back pain. And most of us, I know this program at least was initially intended for folks over 50, but it's, it's hard to find somebody over the age of 60 who doesn't have degenerative disc disease um, and depending on how much degenerative disc disease you have, that will probably determine how much back pain you have. And, um, and so once you can make the diagnosis of why somebody has chronic back pain, which is usually degeneration of the disc, so-called degenerative disc disease, double, triple D, DDD, uh, then you can set up a, a, um, a plan to treat it and treat it quite effectively. Uh, And until we have better treatments, which I think are on the way to treat degenerative disc disease, right now, those of us who have it, and I'm just using this as a single example, um, will use exercise, a little bit of anti-inflammatories, maybe um, take a hot shower in the morning, that also makes it feel better. Use those very benign uh, treatments to get going during the day um, or um, treat ourselves if we overdo it. So that I think that's what you're trying to get at. That's the difference between acute pain and chronic pain. Um, and that's an important distinction that, I, that again, I, I spend quite a bit of time in the book reviewing. Now, I'm kind of curious, how often do you feel surgeries are recommended uh, versus how much they were actually necessary? Oh, that's a trick question. And one of my pet peeves. So to answer the question accurately, um, th- there are no statistics on that. So basically, right. what you're, basically what you're asking me in so many words is how many instances of, pain, of surgery is the surgery really unnecessary? That's what you're asking me. So um, I happen to think and um, that there's a, a great deal of unnecessary surgery. Um, I also think there's a, a lot of unnecessary other treatments. Uh, my dad, who was, a, uh, who was a, a physician also, he said, doctors uh, are like uh, carpenters. What do, you th- what do you mean by that? He meant everything looks like a hammer and a nail, or like an electrician, everything looks like a wire and, a, uh, and an amp meter. Or, so... If you're a surgeon and somebody comes in, you're not, most of us don't think conservative treatment, 
you know, surgeons think, ah, can I, can I cure this person? And unfortunately, what's happening also, and uh, uh, this is what I call the elephant in the room, is that as reimbursement for, for and, and I, I think this is true across the board, as reimbursement to physicians goes down, more past surgeries are being performed that probably, I'm going to be careful with my words here, but I'm going to be very clear, probably don't need to be performed. And I experienced that myself as a, when I'm a patient. And some of it has to do with doctors are um, covering their butts because they don't want to be sued, so they do more tests than they would otherwise. And sometimes it's because there's more or less a financial uh, um, rationale for doing it. And I, I think it's unfortunate, it's, it's shameful, but I think it's the reality of what's happening in medicine. So it's mm -hmm. a long-winded way of answering your question, since we don't have statistics about how often that's true. But I think in general, it's happening and happening more than ever. You know, and, and I agree with you, and, and it's easy to, you know, maybe point your finger and say, well, you know, it's the doctors, but, and it isn't. You know, I, I know that a lot of them, if not most of them, are in, in the field because they really want to do good. You look at, you know, the bureaucracy of insurance companies getting involved where the hospitals get a majority of their funding, so they dictate what actually happens. And then the idea that we seem to be at a highly litigious society, so it's really difficult for doctors to know what to do. You know, it's the dog in the box that hears all the whistles, so to speak. And right. one thing I'd like to talk about quite honestly and, and frankly on the program is that we like to bring things, for instance, like your work, you know, how you can come, for instance, to understand the nature of the challenges that you're facing on your own. I mean, you're really your own best person when it comes to diagnosing. It's your body. You've lived in it. You know, you can say, well, this pain came on, for instance. When did this start? What was I doing that was perhaps different? You know, what about my lifestyle has changed that, you know, this is here now where it wasn't before? And to really kind of do that, it's, you brought up the idea of the, uh, the carpenter, maybe even the auto mechanic is another one. If you could just come to know how does a car work, what are the parts that make it do what it does, then it's easy for you to go into the mechanic and say, this is what I'm pretty sure is wrong, can you fix this, you know, kind of a thing. And too many of us, we surrender that, would rather spend more time, you know, on text messaging and watching movies and entertaining ourselves than really pursuing at least enough good knowledge for ourselves you know, to be able to, to know these things on our own so that we can go to a doctor and say, you know, look, this is what I believe is wrong. I believe this is the nature of what it is. What do you say we pursue, you know, this together rather than, you know, Doc, I'm broken. What do you think you can do? <laughs> you know, and leave it all up to him to do it all or her, excuse me, you know, and, and, and it gets crazy out there. It does. I would also add that I have a sense that um, – there are uh, procedures being done that might otherwise not have been done. There's also what, um, and I, I, I have no obligation to insurance companies, so I could speak freely, but insurance companies also are setting up requirements for procedures frequently that limit the physician's ability to do what he or she, the physician, needs to be done in order to under the, under the category of um, uh, essentially what they're doing is saving money for the insurance company, but under the category saying, well, there's no real evidence that this works. And as we all know, if I wanted a doctor who just goes by the, the, the data, I'll use Dr. Google as my doctor. But a really good doctor, also the, not only the science of medicine, but the art of medicine, who says, you know, I know you said to me, that, you know, I know you sound like you have a herniated disc, 
but there's something about what you're telling me and what you look like that I don't know. That doesn't sound right, and I have to look for, look at something else. And the insurance company would say, what do you mean? They fulfill all the criteria for X, Y, and Z. Why are you looking for A, B, and C? Right. Um, and it, it, and sometimes, as you, I think as you were pointing out, sometimes I had a professor at Columbia who, who always said, the patient knows best. And in the book, I give an example where I had this very nice man keep coming back to me because of what I described in my notes. I went back to my notes, has leg pain, has leg pain, has leg pain. And I put him through a bunch of tests, and I didn't find anything. And finally, this fellow comes to me, and he says, Doctor, you're not listening to me. I don't have pain. I have cramping in my legs. And suddenly, this light goes on in my head, and I said, wait a second, let me see what medicines you're on. And sure enough, he was recently started on a statin for hypercholesterol, and we, all, we know that some of the statins cause leg cramping. And as soon as we stopped his... Um, statin and put him and his doctor put him on a different statin his symptoms disappeared so yeah see and that's exactly what I was talking about you know that's the first step is become your own best detective this came on about this day what's different from that day forward that I'm here now you know correct and and, I mean that's something Everyone can do. You don't need to be a doctor, you know, to do right. this. I mean, it's your body, you know. And I'll give you an example of this since we're talking about back pain. <clears throat> Last summer, uh, I actually had this sort of a phantom knee pain in my left knee. And it was really interesting because it was kind of one of those when I would walk or and I'd sort of make a turn, it was like somebody would take a dagger and run it through my knee, and I thought I was going to drop to the floor at times. It was really rough, you know. And I just kept thinking, you know, this came on, and I had just bought new shoes that were comfortable like crazy. Uh-huh. I mean, the insoles, the whole bit, and, and, and light and airy. I mean, I just loved them. But it was funny because as I went on, and this went on for a good couple of weeks, I thought the only thing I can think of, is the, it's a possibility these shoes just aren't working for me. Right. So what do I do? I go ahead and put the shoes aside, and I get the shoes that I normally wear, that I've worn for years, and within a week, it all disappeared and it hasn't come back since. It was something just that simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But imagine if you go into a doctor, ooh, knee pain, the next thing you know, you're in orthoscopic surgery for crying out yeah. loud, you know, and all it was was a shoe change for 50 bucks, you know. So let, let, me, let me tell you, I could just visualize that scenario, you know, and you took the initiative about thinking about it and making, essentially, you made your own diagnosis. You know, that's what you did. You made, like this fellow who said, doctor, it's not cramping. Now, he didn't make the association with his statin. I had to do that. But he made his own diagnosis. And what is this Dr. Stern talking about? I don't have pain. I got cramping. You said it came on when... Uh, I, I bought a new pair of shoes. You made your own diagnosis. So, you know, in 2020, I know it's 10 days away, or whatever. Um, more and more, we're going to have to participate, be active participants in our medical care. And um, actually, part of the book, a chapter is is called. Um, preparing to work with your healthcare professional. I think I mentioned that. And I smile when a patient comes in and hands me a list of all their medications and a list of all their injuries and all their surgeries. Because not only does it save me time, but it means that person's actually sat down and thought about it and is now an active participant in their health care. And that's what patients, people are going to have to do in the 21st century in order to get the care they want and the care they need. Uh, And that's an important takeaway message. You know, I'm remembering uh, that uh, 1987 film Roadhouse starring Patrick Swayze where he does that very thing. He shows up with a cut on his shoulder to the doctor 
and he just simply hands the doctor his medical records, and she says, do you always carry your medical records around with you? And he says, it saves time. <laughs> right. It saves time. It helps you make the diagnosis, doctor. Yeah. You know, instead of sitting there, you know, spending most of your time trying to figure out what's going on. Here, here's my records, and this started happening at this time. Okay, well, I can see by your history, yeah. you know, there it is. Uh, you know, now, just to let people know, too, uh, it's really fascinating in your book that you also seem to cover uh, what you might call Eastern modalities, things like Qigong, uh, perhaps acupuncture. And, and I kind of wonder, uh, what are your thoughts? Because uh, there's an industry that, to me, seems to get beat up a lot and made fun of, especially in like the show Two and a Half Men. Uh, that is the chiropractic uh, practice. W- you know, you're a neurosurgeon. I mean, what are your thoughts about what those people do? Well, let's talk about chiropractors. Okay. Chiropractic, chiropractors take care of more individuals with low back pain than any other profession. And um, I think chiropractors, I, I'll have to say from the very beginning that I have a very strong bias in favor of chiropractors. I sat on the um, a board of trustees of the New York Chiropractic College for many years and have many chiropractor friends and, uh, and colleagues. And the interesting thing about chiropractors is not only do they treat, chiro- treat back pain quite effectively, but equally importantly, they know when chiropractic is no longer appropriate refer the individual to a physician or a surgeon like myself. Because with with accuracy, I would think, too, you know, they know exactly why they're sending somebody in a particular direction. Exactly. So it's right. kind of like really having two opinions rather than just one. So I think that's exactly right. And, and you know, most chiropractors treat, treat individuals intensely. So it's not like they see them once and see them again a month later. They'll see them repetitively so they get a real feel for who that individual is. And lots of chiropractors have a really well-honed sense of the, again, I'll mention the word art of medicine, and know that now this uh, acu- uh, chiropractor is not going to help this individual. I better you know, have this checked out or get another opinion by someone who specializes in, in, uh, in back pain. Uh, and, there, and, and because of that, I... Um, I see a lot of patients refer to me from from chiropractors. So, you know, lastly, what I would like to cover, you know, obviously we've covered, you know, the idea of how to uh, get an idea of how to unlock the uh, back's unique pain code, uh, how to, you know, prepare yourself to work with healthcare professionals, obviously. Be prepared before you go into the office, you know, uh, uh, as we've been talking about, you know, really ask questions, do some homework if you can. Uh, don't just go in there and just say, I surrender this all to you kind of a thing, uh, because that may not work out too well. Uh, you know, being able to find the you know proper diagnosis. And, you know, when we were talking about chiropractic, I, I know I went in for a, a particular situation between my neck and shoulder blade that was just devastatingly painful. And he says, I'm going to go ahead and make an adjustment, but you're going to be even in more pain for at least a half a day than you are now. And I said, I don't care because this is 24 hours right now, and I can't do anything about it, you know. And he was right, but then it went away, and it was a wonderful thing. Um, but now we have to kind of address when it may be above the neck, as you say in your book. <laughs> yeah. So I think... There's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist. No, I understand. But, you know, we've actually covered this quite a bit, for instance, when we talk about uh, trauma and PTSD. And you'd be amazed how, how often at times pain occurs in parts of the body due to a past uh, trauma, you know, uh, and that once that's addressed, how that pain seems to go away. So the body's really unique that way. And saying, yeah, I'm going to store this here, but, you know, it's kind of a reminder we still need to deal with this somehow. And if you don't, I'm going to get more painful to remind you this needs to be dealt with. 
Yeah, yeah. absolutely right. There's, there's mm-hmm. an interesting article written by um, a psychologist named Joel Haber. I'm, I think he was at the University of Wisconsin, maybe, or University of Alabama, who did an analysis of women with chronic back pain. I don't remember the exact statistic, but a very, very large percentage of them, maybe 20, 30% of them, had been either physically or sexually abused. So they were still oh carrying, they still were carrying that abuse in their bodies. Uh, and it was manifesting, this is me interpreting it, and it was manifesting itself as chronic pain. And I think what he was trying to say is that once they deal, and I think all of us who deal with a traumatic event, uh, the only way we can uh, cope with that traumatic event is by dealing with it in therapy or you know, psychologically. Uh, so what you're saying I think is absolutely correct. You look at all the veterans who uh, were in these horrific situations in, in, on the battlefield or outside the battlefield, but just observe things that nobody should ever see. And for the rest of their lives, unless they deal with it in some uh, manner, are left with psychological scars that can manifest themselves as bodily pain. Um, and that's, that's a, it's a sad thought in a way, um, because a lot of folks don't even know that the pain is really a manifestation of a psychological scar. Yeah. So uh, I guess if we could address the question then, how do we know then maybe perhaps that the pain is a result of just our thinking? I mean, does it seem to manifest in a different way or uh, from your experience that is? Yeah, it's usually, yes. Um, This is just my clinical experience is that I frequently feel that Patients who have chronic pain and have significant, de- who come across as, as depressed or not as communicative as I feel they should be, um, are harboring, and this is, I have nothing to base it on except my, just my, my sense, my... Yeah, fair enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is that there's something more than just the physical pain going on. You know, when the patient comes in and says to me in, in a tone as if they were describing the pen on my desk and they say, you know, Dr. Stern, every day I have the worst pain in the whole world. And the, the, as someone once said, the music and the lyrics don't go together. So um, if you're in the worst pain, how can you say it so dispassionately? And... Um, there are clues that you pick up, that I've picked up, that other physicians who are doing this for a long time, we pick it up. And again, it's kind of the art of the medicine, uh, not the science of the medicine, that you, um, that you get cues. We all get cues from one another, okay? Uh, you get a cue immediately meeting somebody, whether it's, it's probably subconscious, cue within a few minutes about who this person is. Do you like the person? Do you think the person is honest? Um, you know, and you get them to get these messages subconsciously, not even consciously. And I think that's part of the experience of seeing lots and lots of patients with a problem that you start getting a, a gestalt, a sense of who the patient is who has a significant psychological component. And I never say that the pain doesn't exist because if you tell me you have pain, and you're experiencing pain, I believe it. I absolutely believe it because I cannot feel your pain, so I have to trust you're telling me the truth and that you're experiencing pain. And then the question is, what can I do to to either to help you deal with the pain, knowing that a significant amount of that pain is not physiological but emotional. And there, there are ways of doing it. I, again, I'm not a psychotherapist, but there, there are ways of doing it nowadays uh, with a series of new techniques and old techniques to help you deal with the pain that has a psychological component. 
Having said that, I, I, would, I would say one more thing, and that is when I'm in pain, I feel, a, maybe because I'm more um, attuned to it, but I feel that I get depressed. And I get depressed because I can't function. And um, I'll, I'll finish the, the thought with one other uh, observation, and that is I, I, I think there's a concept, uh, maybe someday I'll write about it, called death of body parts. That is, I truly believe that whether it's through aging, injury, whether it's back pain or some other injury or just aging, and we realize that consciously or frequently unconsciously that we can't do what we did before and we have this sense again unconsciously usually that part of us is not there anymore that part of me that was able to do a hundred sit-ups 20 years ago isn't there anymore and in a way I mourn for that part of me that's now gone and that can cause cause depression and, and, and create a significant psychological component to what we all know is the mind-body connection. But without um, going into it much further, I think that is an important, especially as we get older, I think uh, that is something really significant to look at in ourselves. I know there was something I wanted to bring up, and it was really a wonderful uh, story that really hits on this, and this was an experiment that was done uh, where an individual apparently had a missing arm, and we've heard about what they call that uh, uh, phantom limb, limb syndrome. And uh, there yeah. was an experiment that was conducted on uh, uh, public radio. If you wouldn't mind kind of telling that story briefly, because I thought that was really unique on how that particular challenge was resolved uh, with the individual with the uh, missing arm. Yes, um, it's, it's, um, there's a f- world-famous um, neuroscientist at the University of um, San Diego. Um, and I'm Almost as famous as you, I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> no, no, this, this fellow in scientific circles that, uh, he has an Indian name. I think it's called Rama, Ramachandran. I think that's the name. Yeah, Ramachandran. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, he had a, I'll just give you the concepts without the specific thing. And um, he um, observed that many, particularly um, in areas where there is trauma, people lose their limbs. And but the brain, so the physical, there's a physical absence of that body part. But the brain still senses that the body part is there. And that the body part, though absent, still causes pain. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing concept, fascinating concept which has another point I can discuss why I think that has universal uh, importance in many other areas. So, the, so he devised a technique, and I'm not going to go into it specifically. Uh, I'll leave that as a, as a, as a lead-in to someone getting a hold of my book. Ah. He figured, ah, <laughs> he figured, we, we knew you were a trickster. <laughs> but that's fine because if people don't get the book, they're really missing out on a really fascinating way to look into what we've been talking about. You know, become your very your very own person of diagnosis. You don't know, learn this stuff for yourself. Don't just leave, you know, I've got this pain and you need to deal with it. It's really up to you. And I say this over and over and over on this program. You know, we'll open the window, but you've got to decide whether you're going to look out. Or we'll open the door, you've got to decide whether you're going to walk through, but it's all up to you. Or in right. the end, you live with the results that you have. So, yeah, it's, a, it's that old expression: you can lead a horse to water, but you can't right. make them drink. You know, so. <laughs> and some of them just won't drink. Anyway, you were saying. And the, and the other thing um, is, I, I started um, because I had such a positive response to the book. 
there are lots of individuals who like to pursue their own issues further. So um, I sure. started a website called Dr. Very creative here, drjackstern.com. I couldn't think of anything more creative except my name. So it's drjackstern.com. <laughs> and it's an easy one to spell, too. <laughs> right, and it's easy to spell. Where, I, where there's actually a place uh, on the website where people can contact me, um, where I um, welcome their, their uh, medical histories and even will review um, their uh, MRIs or CAT scans and then get back to them. It's modern tele, telemedicine um, in, in, for those folks who have pain who still are looking for some response to their pain. Uh, so that's a, that's a service that I started uh, trying to use 21st century technology. And, and uh, you can find that on the website, Dr. Jack Stern. Now, lastly, here's what I'd like to talk about. Uh, and, you know, it's a nice general because, like you said, I'd rather have people actually pick this up. And I like the way it's written. It's a real easy read. It's, it's fascinating more than it is technical. But yet, it has the right amount of technical to re- make you realize, okay, this is grounded in, in reality here. But uh, And that would be what you would call step five. And I love this, and I'm just going to read the title of the chapter because with the exception of one thing, everything here is free. Okay, and this is the title. You harness the power of posture. God knows how many of us don't have correct posture. Uh, movement, sleep, and positive thinking. And lastly, a healthy diet. I mean, you know, you got five things here, and four of those are things that don't cost you anything. <laughs> right, right. That's exactly right. Just and some I, time, I want, yeah. Yeah, just time and effort. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and I say again, uh, from a personal point of view, I was at the gym this morning, and I see so many young folks working out. You know, healthy, thin. Um, muscular, but not crazy muscular. And I say to myself, Jack, why weren't you doing this when you, I mean, I know why I wasn't doing it. I was too busy studying to get into medical school. But um, why weren't you doing this when you were a young man? Maybe if you'd done that over the last X number of years, you wouldn't be having your chronic back pain. So what I'm saying is that When we're young and we think we're invincible and we don't realize that Mother Nature, God willing, because we all want to live long enough, is going to catch up with us. And if Mother Nature catches up with us, we're going to start aching and moaning. And I think we can avoid some of that aching and moaning uh, and living a healthier, by starting out living a healthier lifestyle. Uh, And so as we do get older, because thank goodness we are all getting older uh, with uh, modern medicine, we'll be able to be more functional as we get older. And if there's a message in all this, um, I think that's a really important message. Although, taking example from my own kids, they also think they're invincible. Although, I think three of the four now are exercising regularly. They're in their 30s and 40s. So uh, you drive the message home enough and maybe your own family gets it because you didn't when you were younger. You know, and here's the thing, because we've had a lot of fantastic stories over the years on our show about resilience, and there was one gentleman we interviewed. Oh, this has to go back at least. See, we've been on the air 17 years, so this must have been right around year three, I want to say, when we started the show back in uh, the early 2000s. It was a uh, gentleman out of Canada, a guy by the name of Jacques, and uh, he was actually 66 years old and a paraplegic. And he decided, <clears throat> I can't remember how it all started for him, but he began to learn stretching exercises. This was a guy bound to a wheelchair, okay? Mm. And what had happened is he began to do these stretches. He really started getting into it. And he did it more and more, and I think it went, and, and I'm loosely stating the periods here, that, but I think it was within six months he began to actually get up out of the wheelchair. He began mm-hmm. to walk. Then he began to walk more. And this is a man that's actually walked all the way across coast to coast in Canada and the United States. <laughs> and at 66, he was bound to a wheelchair. <laughs> so I guess the point being is you read, you know, like your book, Ending Back Pain, and, 
and for the listeners out there, you know, really take heed to what we're saying and, and be, you know, take initiative, you know, be responsible and do your homework, is that it's really amazing, and I'm sure you've seen this in your own practice over the 30-plus years you've been doing what you've been doing. The body just has this miraculous way of responding. It wants to. You just have to give it a fair shot to do it, and it'll just it'll be amazing what happens. Yep, I think that's right. I think that's right. So longevity is great, but being functional with your longevity is even better. I know I used to think that too until as I was getting into my mid-20s, I said, I guess living a long time is great, but what happens if I'm not doing much? So it really matters. You're exactly right. Well, it's been wonderful to have you on the program, uh, Dr. Stern, or we can call you Jack. Uh, Your website is jackstern.com, correct? Dr. Dr. Jack Stern, if you don't mind. Oh, Dr. Jack Stern, there you go. (laughs) Oh, yeah, you've know, earned it. I, usually when I say Dr. Jack Stern, I get charged double. There you go. <laughs> but in, this, in, this, in this case, in yeah. order to find the website, it's Dr. Jack Stern. Dr. So it is Dr. Jack Stern, the website? Dot com, yeah. I'm okay. Yeah, very good. And the book is Ending Back Pain, and I'm sure people can also find this on Amazon as well, I'm sure. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Very good. Well, Dr. Right. Jack Stern, if you may, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the program and have a wonderful holiday. Thank you. You too. Thanks for having such a great uh, sense of humor. Really excellent uh, interview. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. I want to thank you, the listeners out there, uh, for tuning in. You can discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. Keep up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.